Hello. So this is a screencast on my notes on lecture 11 from Sergey Levine's course, which was given by a guest lecturer on advanced model-based reinforcement learning approaches. Um, here's, you can find the video here, uh, the original video that this is va based on. Um, so what we'll be covering is models in latent space. Uh, we'll be covering modeling the state transitions in image space directly inverse models and then um, predicting alternative quantities, you kind of an engineered approach. Um, so let's start with latent space modeling. Um, so basically you can use an autoencoder to take a high dimensional space and capture most of the information in a low dimensional space that can then be re-expanded to the high dimensional to reproduce the high dimensional input space. So that's an autoencoder. Um, so that's how they generate their latent space. This is just neural network stuff. Um, now once you have this latent space, then you can do your model-based RL in this latent space much more efficient, efficiently. And for example, you could use LQR because for LQR you need X to be, you know, reasonably sized. Um, whereas for an image you have a very high dimensional input overall if you look at all the pixels. So LQR is not possible. Um, so, yeah, so here's a depiction of how this works. So we learn our encoder using an autoencoder uh, setup. So G encodes, a, encodes our observation into a latent space, X. And then in this latent space, we learn if we take action U1, then we're going to end up in state X2, right? So then we learn our model dynamics in this latent space. And then um, this will not be quite correct, but if we want to plan for several steps, then we use our predicted value here, and then we predict the next value, and so on. Um, and then at the next time step, we get the actual observation. So then, of course, we're going to use our g function to get the actual latent representation here, not the predicted one, and we'll start planning from that point in time again, right? Model predictive control. Yeah. Um, so there's some variations of this. Um, you can just use an autoencoder, or you can jointly um, train something that will map to a latent space so that you're able to reconstruct the original image, that's autoencode, but you're also able to predict the next latent representation accurately. So you can jointly train those, and uh, it seems like it should work better to uh, train a representation that allows you to, to do your forward model well. Um, and also captures the information, right? Um, why not train something to do both at once, right? It's basically end-to-end -end training tends to work better. Um, oh yeah, so this is a depiction of that. You learn to, your autoencoder, your encoder learns to create some latent representation that you can use to get back your original image, but you can also use it to predict the next latent representation, which should be close to the actual latent representation, right? So you have some L, L squared loss between these two. Yeah. All right. So here's where you pause the video and think about each question. So what is the advantage of working in a latent space? Well, since it's lower dimensional, it's just far more computationally efficient, right? That's, that's the, uh, the main thing. Um, also, you might not he might help you get you get around overfitting as well, right? Um, so what is a drawback of working in a latent space? Well, inevitably, when you you uh, map to a lower dimensional space, you're going to be throwing away some information, right? And so the autoencoder is trying to it's trying to reconstruct the image. So it's like got some l l squared loss in pixel space, right? And so that's the autoencoder's task. Whereas we want to use the information to, you know, model forward dynamics, which is a different task, right? And so you get some inevitable loss of performance when you train something for one task and you want to do a, a different task, right? Um, yeah. So that's that's the issue, basically. Um, yeah. So it's not ideal, but 
in some cases can be very effective. Um, but from what I've seen, it's like more in toy examples so far that this has been quite effective. Um, cool. So, if we don't want to throw away information, well, why don't we try modeling state transitions directly in image space? Sure, it might cost more, but uh, maybe it'll work better, right? So that's the next section here. Um, so you can use something like a UNet here to generate the next image. Given the current image, oh, my Lix is not uh, <laughs> not working properly. Um, so what they do is they train it to initially predict the next state given the current action, right? And so why do they do this rather than so th first they predict the next state um, but then after it can predict the next state fairly well then they train it to predict three frames and five frames into the future um, so that it becomes better at kind of longer range planning so pause the video um, so why train it for three to five frames into the future if it can predict the next frame and then we could use that prediction of the next frame to predict the frame after and so on, right? So why do we want to all at once learn to predict three to five frames into the future? Well, basically it's end-to-end -end optimizations tends to perform better. That's why neural networks overall work really well for lots of tasks, um, whereas hand-engineered uh, and engineering doesn't work as well. Um, so if you just predict a single frame into the future, then there's going to be some error in that, right? And then you're, when you predict the next frame into the future, you're using a model that hasn't been trained on how to make predictions using previous input that includes error, right? So now we're doing end-to-end -end training where we learn to handle this error better to make multi-step predictions. So another question, if it's better to predict three to five or more frames into the future, why don't we start with that? Why start by training it to only predict one frame into the future? Um, and the reason relates to um, what uh, might go wrong if we give it a really hard task of, you know, given this sequence of five actions, what do you think happens? What do you think it, uh, what do you think our neural network might end up doing? All right, uh, so basically, if you give it a task that's too hard, you know, it can't kind of start going um, up the gradient to optimize it. And so it'll just find a good local optimum, which is generally with images, they don't change too much. So it'll just predict the current image. Oh, five frames later, it'll probably be about the current image, right? Um, so, so yeah, we don't want it to get stuck in this local optimum and starting with only one frame into the future can help. Now, does this actually work? Um, predicting future pixels seems like a fairly challenging task. Um, and it turns out yes for simple tasks and no for even somewhat more complicated tasks. So far, it isn't working that well. Um, you, can, you can look at this here um, to see, see this in action. Uh, here are some snapshots. Um, so here, this is the ground truth. This is the prediction. So the prediction is pretty good. Now here, you know, things are less deterministic. Here the cars always drive forward, so it works very well. Here the fish change direction and whatnot. And so it's just like, oh, the best prediction is just that it's blue everywhere because I don't know where the fish are going to go. <laughs> so it does not work very well in even a somewhat more complicated example here. Now you can see this background is very uniform, right? We don't have trees in the background with their the sunlight, uh, daylight shimmering between their leaves. We don't have complicated pixel changes like that, right? This is a still a fairly simple task and it's totally failing. Um, cool. So yeah, so basically so far this doesn't work that well. Um, the freeway game is that one example where it does seem to work very well, quite well in all the other games we can see. Um, beyond maybe zero or one step, it really does not do very good at reconstructing or at predicting uh, the image. Cool. So um, there's also some engineered solutions which look at kind of 
objects and how they move, and these seem to be more successful right now. So um, this seems to you know always work before we get an end-to-end -end work method working well. We can use our human understanding of the specific task, engineer something to perform that task better. Um, I didn't understand the details of this, but they're like tracking different options and think trying to figure out what will happen. And uh, yeah, apparently it works. It works better um, with uh, some training on random data. It could actually do some useful stuff. Well, I'm not sure about useful, but somewhat impressive stuff. Um, yeah, cool. So let's move ahead to inverse models. So what do you think an inverse model is? You know, maybe pause it and think about that. So an inverse model is where you're given the current state and the next state, and you are trying to guess what action happened in between. Um, and so this allows us to learn an embedding of, you know, this allows us to learn a latent space. Now there's some interesting applications of this. Um, so basically, this inverse model, you give it, oh, I've got these two states, what action was taken? And so what they did is they were like, okay, this is where I want to get to, this is where I am now, ask your inverse mo model, what action did I take? Now, your inverse model, it's, when we train this model, we assume that there exists an action, right? But you're probably asking it, tell me what the action was, when there is no action that actually takes you between here and here in a single step. But you say, in one step, what takes me there? And you perform that action, and then you try that again and again. And it works sometimes, kind of, and other times it doesn't really work. So, yeah, an interesting idea with so-so results again. Um, so an advantage, no image reconstruction, which is very challenging. Uh, you can't plan, right? We were always asking it with a single action, how do you get straight to the goal state, right? And doing that greedy approach. Um, now another big issue with inverse models is it, it only is trying to predict the action, right? So if you've got some robotic hand which did something, then it might just look at, oh, the robotic hand ended up here. And it can use that very well to predict what action happened. So this, it's not capturing anything about the object that the robotic hand was trying to move, right? So, um, like, yeah, like autoencoders, I mean, this is just trained for the specific tasks it's trained for, and it may completely ignore other stuff, which, you know, when we create a latent space, we, we might care about other things, right? Um, so interestingly, um, these inverse models were used to create a latent space, which is used to create curiosity, um, which is, I think, a really cool idea. I plan to go over that later. Um, yeah, so it's an interesting kind of idea to keep around, may have some useful applications. Now, lastly, we can kind of get in there and engineer things by predicting some alternative quantities, where predicting those quantities may help us, you know, plan for the, the, main, the main task, right? Um, so this requires some hand engineering, and we might predict, predict things like, will it successfully grasp? Will it collide? Things like that. Will you get damage? Um, and so, yeah, we need some hand engineering, um, but of course this can work quite well if we engineer it well. Yeah, so that's a quick overview of these kind of advanced approaches, uh, which it seems like with some engineering we can get some decent results, um, and without engineering they're kind of more working on toy tasks um, somewhat successfully. Yeah. Thanks for watching.